So, um, I would like to offer a slightly different perspective with this uh, presentation, that of uh, digital humanities. Eleftheria earlier mentioned uh, a digital humanities compulsory course embedded within a digital archaeology program, but, of, but what if we have exactly the opposite? Uh, we're talking about digital humanities programs where a digital archaeology course is embedded in that. So in the last five years, uh, I have been uh, teaching digital archaeology and heritage courses, broadly defined, and we can talk about the definition of digital archaeology uh, later, uh, embedded in a digital humanities and spatial uh, humanities uh, master's program in my previous institution in Maynooth University in Ireland. Uh, there were no other archaeology courses, nor other archaeologists, um, no related departments, no staff members, nothing. So, and this actually has become quite common in the last few years. We have seen lots of digital archaeologists absorbed in digital humanities centers. Uh, and they are hired not to teach digital archaeology, but different methodological and theoretical frameworks uh, for dealing with cultural heritage data. So, of course, there is a challenge here. How do you integrate digital archaeology uh, and or digital heritage in a program that typically doesn't get any or just a few archaeologists? Uh, students coming from various humanities disciplines, literature, history, um, media and so forth. How to make such a course relevant uh, for a broader demographic and how do you deal with archaeology, with archaeological information? How do you engage students with it? Can you do it actually? So uh, the courses I have been uh, teaching and I'm going to uh, refer to here uh, mainly revolve around the remediation um, of the physical in three-dimensional forms, uh, having students consider the ethical, uh, methodological, theoretical and practical issues um, regarding representation, reconstruction and reproduction. This includes tools for digitization, uh, capturing processing software, annotation, online 3D repositories, but also, you know, it's equally important to have the theories behind, uh, the debates about the digitization of material culture, things like authenticity, reconstruction, transparency, the aura of the digital, and so on and so forth. Uh, and despite the fact that much teaching in digital archaeology and digital humanities utilizes real-world examples, artifacts and documentary sources, um, I want to argue here that the full uh, pedagogic potential of experiential learning cannot be realized unless the pedagogy is embedded within a problem and project-based learning environment that follows the maker culture uh, ethos. And although uh, digital humanities has embraced uh, uh, maker culture, there's very little consensus um, regarding how learning by making and doing uh, can empower students to become critical thinkers and makers uh, through self-reflexivity, through uh, uh, problem solving. And of course, when we talk about making, we should not only constrain ourselves to physical making in maker spaces, but of course, digital making. Uh, in digital archaeology, we're doing lots of uh, digital making that also um, brings about both personalized and collaborative learning opportunities. But how is the maker culture ethos applied to digital archaeology teaching? So it is very common, uh, for example, to see uh, digital archaeology being taught by using step-by-step -step tutorials through which students uh, learn software interfaces and how to push buttons, as Ariana said earlier, uh, how to operate hardware. And that's how I was taught at the University of Southampton 12 years ago uh, in the Masters in um, uh, Archaeological Computing. Uh, such approaches often diminish a very complex methodological approach that requires understanding of the broader context and the challenges it poses to skills learning. And I personally have an allergy to the word skills, especially when it, it's used to define these low-level skills related to software and, and hardware. And teaching in such a way leaves little to no room for experimentation, creativity and failure. And failure is very important, uh, but unfortunately in academia is a taboo since it is considered too embarrassing and too disruptive uh, for both students and us as uh, pedagogues uh, to be consciously integrated into the teaching uh, praxis. Uh, 
And there are many interesting examples uh, of teaching in such a way. For example, so, uh, Son Graham in his critical making uh, uh, class, he talks about uh, a culture of open notebooks and fail logs where uh, it's not the end product that is assessed, but the whole process and the reflection uh, throughout the process. Uh, so transforming digital archaeology learning from an individual isolating experience based on the teaching of skills to a collaborative and experiential learning environment through problem and project-based learning in which students work together to complete an end product uh, that materializes their knowledge and understanding uh, equips them with more a more holistic uh, skill set as well as the experience and confidence to respond to an increasingly competitive digital and creative economy in academia and beyond. And of course, problem-based learning uh, is based on four core pi pillars, on four principles. It's self-directed, which means the students guide the whole learning process and instructors are only facilitators. It's collaborative, so students work towards a common goal. Uh, they learn from each other, peer learning and so forth. It's contextual, so they work in meaningful context. This might be in the case of digital archaeology, heritage institutions, uh, museums, um, working with real life uh, examples outside of the class classroom bubble. And it's constructive because they uh, discuss, they get peer feedback, uh, they go into a, a discussion and debate about the, uh, um, the various elements of their courses. But of course, teaching using PPL can be challenging as the outcomes of the learning process are varied and often unpredictable. So um, I want just to show you one such uh, example that my 3D Cuneiform project that my students uh, of the MA in Digital Humanities and MSc in Special e Humanities uh, at Maynooth University in Ireland completed uh, in the academic year 2017-18. And there's a link uh, uh, you can visit the resource. So the whole course worth 10 CTS was structured around this project. So the course was the project for which students under, undertook the entire uh, project life cycle from defining the problem, developing an approach and delivering the solution. Uh, so there was a special collections uh, library in uh, Maynooth University that had a collection of 65 cuneiform uh, tablets brought by an Irish uh, army chaplain during World War One. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it's challenging in every respect. So the first element, the first challenge is probably, well, to set up this, the project and work with the curator or whoever is the collaborator and persuade them that such a project would be a win-win situation. Uh, and given that the students I'm talking about are not archaeologists, do not have an archaeology background, probably apart from uh, one or two. It's rather challenging to persuade a curator, uh, in the case of an archaeological collection, that students, 15 to 20 students, could handle these objects and produce something meaningful. And I think this also comes from a bad experience that many um, museum curators have with internships, um, because um, uh, th they have uh, lo lots of uh, issues where they do so something, but they don't. Nothing gets uh, out of this process. So uh, the students started working in uh, small teams, contributed to specific aspects of the final projects based on their skills, on their expertise and interests. And this included project management, content development, web design, uh, creation of uh, video content, audio narratives, technical integration, social media, and so forth. Uh, and of course, one aspect of the project was using photogrammetry to digitize uh, the sources, uh, sorry, the, the tablets. Uh, project management was also taught through risk assessment, mitigation strategies, gun charts, tools such as uh, Slack, Google Drive, Trello, and so on and so forth. But of course, these also had elements. The students had to decide about the standards. Uh, they had to uh, follow the same procedure. They have to produce a quite unified uh, result. And of course, team dynamics is always a challenge. Uh, there are people who hold back or push forward the team, uh, team members that are more, more challenged than others, those who do what they say uh, and those who don't, uh, those who decide not to follow whatever has been agreed, uh, but do something different. 
And although this can be, I have to say, quite frustrating, all these are not dissimilar to the kind of dynamics you encounter in, in research uh, teams and funded projects. So, uh, uh, ju just last few slides, it was not only creating the 3Ds, but creating a knowledge site to host these models, providing contextual information, um, uh, information about the process of creation, following a design thinking approach uh, through which they ideate, prototype, test, refine, and so forth, wireframing a website, um, working as a team to come up with a design that will work for a particular collection, so design pretty, but also design functional, um, and you know some screenshots of the of the of the interface with the different sections, uh, how the three D models will be integrated, what metadata will be included, and so on and so forth. Uh, even coming up with with the logo for the project, doing some three D printing that will be used for the uh, educational programs of the library, and throughout the whole process, reflecting uh, on this through publicly accessible uh, blogs and finishing the project with a presentation of the Royal Aris Academy as part of the Virtual Heritage Network conference. So, to conclude, uh, teaching digital archaeology is not only about teaching skills. It's not about learning how to use different software and interfaces. We said that in the uh, earlier session. Uh, I cannot argue that the latter is not important. Of course, it's important. However, learning a software can be done uh, in a flipped classroom setting, uh, devoting class time to more creative and rewarding activities that enable independent thinking and problem solving. Uh, problem and project-based learning is quite challenging for both instructors and students. Such projects require such a diversity of skills and can easily collapse due to various managerial, technological or interpersonal uh, issues. Uh, therefore, require lots of preparation, supervision and management and in comparison to an ordinary class, it's more difficult to set up, more difficult to manage uh, all the different floating elements and make sure that there was something tangible produced at the end. So collaborative, constructive, contextual and student learning provides students with the ability to critically respond to different situations, enables them to exercise responsibility for their own learning and use their weaknesses to improve their practice. They learn by making and doing, often by making mistakes, making wrong choices, often jeopardizing the whole project, but also reflecting on the process and the lessons learned. In my view, such teaching uh, is far more engaging and rewarding for the instructors, but also for students who become socially responsible, more employable, and empowered to respond to emerging challenges in different fields, sectors, and the society. Thank you.